Blessings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our continued study on the Gospel of John. Today we will be focusing on John chapter 2 in verses 1 through 12. So thank you for being here today. And let's open up in a word of prayer so we can invite the Lord into our time and also prepare our hearts, minds, and spirits what the Lord has to say to us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Lord, thank you for giving us the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ and sons and daughters of the one true God. I pray, Lord, that you will prepare our hearts, minds, and spirits to receive your word and to receive your truth Guide us, Lord, and direct us, not only into what you want us to understand, but also into the things that have direct applications to our lives. Lord, our hope and desire is that you will be glorified in and through all that we do and say. And Lord, we invite you into this time today. We pray that you will illuminate your word and may your will be done. Thank you, Lord, for everything, and thank you for those that you have brought here today to study your word. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Well, let's start by reading the passage today that we're going to be taking a look at. The passage is, as I mentioned, John chapter 2. We're going to look at the first 12 verses. And this is actually the first miracle that Jesus did as he walked this earth. And this has a special meaning in a number of ways. We'll see a couple of the symbols that come to light as we look at this story. There's also, however, some misinterpretation of this particular story in the scriptures that we will want to address as well. And we will do that as we break it down verse by verse. So first, let's take a look at the passage. If you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Starting in verse 1, it says, And the third day... There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatsoever he hath said unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made into wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but you, have kept the good wine 
unto now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. This is a very symbolic miracle, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. First of all, let's set the stage a little bit, and uh, which will bring us to a, a problem that had occurred and how that problem was tended to. The first thing that we will note is that this event or the people that were getting married had to have some kind of close tie to the personal family of Jesus Christ. This was not just any wedding. This had some either close friends or actual family members to Jesus and his family. If you will note in verse 2, it says that both Jesus was called and so were his disciples to the marriage, meaning they were invited guests to the wedding. However, if you look at verse 1, it says that the mother of Jesus was there, but it does not say she was an invited guest. The fact that she was there and obviously helping with the preparations, maybe even the serving of the guests, seems to be a clear indication that this was, again, either a close family member or a close friend. And she was one of the family members who was there to help, to make sure that everything went well down to the final detail. Jesus and his disciples, however, were invited guests according to this passage. Now, just as a little bit of background, the fact that this passage also says that Jesus traveled there with his brothers, his earthly brothers, was also an indication that, again, this would have had some familial tie to the whole thing. A wedding feast in Jesus' day usually lasted seven days. It was quite a feast. It was quite a celebration. For those seven days, all the food and wine and drink was provided by the parents of the bride and the groom. Which means that they would have had to have taken into account every meal that they would have been eating with all these guests. Not just the marriage supper itself, but every meal for seven days, they had to make sure to plan properly so that there would be enough food and drink for everyone. In this day, family honor was a very high priority. The honor of a family 
to take good care of their guests and to put on an appropriate celebration for their sons or for their son and for their daughter. If a family such as this would have run out of food or wine, it would imply one of two things. It would imply that either they were thoughtless and they did not plan properly in order to serve their guests, or it would imply that the family was impoverished. They were poor and maybe did not have the resources in which to put on such a feast. Whether it was because they were poor or whether it was because they didn't plan properly, either way, running out of food or drink would certainly have dishonored the whole family. It would have been an embarrassment. And it would have certainly brought shame to every member of the family. It wasn't necessarily because of pride that they would be cautious with such a thing. It was to do what was right and honoring for the bride and the groom, first and foremost. And secondly, for all the invited guests who were all guests of honor at such an amazing feast as this would have been. So you could imagine that depending how many guests would have attended such a feast, which in many cases was a very large number, just the food preparation alone would have been a major undertaking, let alone having a place for the guests to sleep, having a suitable place where everyone can fit in comfortably for the feast, and as I mentioned, for all the additional meals that they would have had in a seven-day period of time. And by the way, some feasts lasted longer than seven days. So it was up to the parents of the bride and groom to make sure that everything went off without a hitch for the honor of the family name, which certainly would have been dragged through the mud if the food was poor or if there was an inad inadequate amount or for such a celebration of this to have run out of wine would have been unheard of. This particular wedding would have occurred a little bit over a month's period of time after the baptism of Jesus Christ. So the, the baptism of Jesus Christ was his first act of obedience to his father and which introduced him to the Jews as the Son of God, as his predecessor, John the Baptist, would have driven home to everyone that was there, including all the Jewish leaders. So about a month later, or a little over a month later, this would have introduced him now into society, into the, the family lifestyle of the Jews as well, not to just, Jew, just to the Jewish leaders 
and not to bear witness and testimony alone to the Heavenly Father. One other thing we want to make mention just in the way of background here. In this story of the miracle of, a, of a, at Cana, there is no mention of the father, the earthly father of Jesus, who we know as Joseph. Joseph is not mentioned as a guest, nor is he mentioned as Mary was, as someone who is already there helping to prepare and to serve. The only thing that would have prevented Joseph from being there was his physical death. For a family member didn't miss an event such as this. So in all probability, Joseph already died. And so that left just the mother of Jesus here at this wedding feast. Now, it doesn't take long, but we already see very clearly that there was a problem. In verse 3, it clearly indicates that there was not enough wine to go around. Sometimes these wedding feasts had additional people that showed up that were not originally invited guests. But at such a feast, the family of the bride and groom would open up to additional guests, whoever would want attend, to attend, for it was certainly a time of celebration. So maybe it was due to the fact that there were additional guests, or maybe it was due to the fact that maybe just people drank a lot of wine. I, It doesn't say in the passage. All it does say is that the mother of Jesus, I'm in verse 3, said unto Jesus, they have no wine. So whatever the reason, there wasn't enough to go around, and this was certainly not a good thing. For this was only the beginning of the whole, ce the whole celebration. Notice that in verse 3, in nowhere does Mary command Jesus or tell Jesus that he must do a miracle and make more wine. That is not the context of this verse at all. All she told him was there was no wine. And knowing that the family's honor was at stake, she left it up to Jesus as to how he was going to take care of that situation. Now, I wanted to start here in, in making us aware of why or how this passage gets twisted around a little bit, in particular by the Roman Catholic Church. I was brought up Roman Catholic, so I'm very familiar with the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. My family is, is, has a Catholic background. But this particular passage is used by the Roman Catholic Church to back up 
the false doctrine and the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church regarding Mary. Yes, Mary is the earthly mother of Jesus. But the Catholic Church refers to her often as the mother of God. Now, one would look at this and say, well, we just got done talking in Romans or in uh, John chapter one, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. That is correct. But we have to understand who the scriptures present Mary as in contrast with what the Roman Catholic Church and other faiths believe Mary to be. Mary is the earthly mother of God. And she is to be respected as such. I'm sorry. The earthly mother of of Jesus, not God. God does not have a mother. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, we talked about extensively in chapter one, are all eternal beings who never had a beginning. And they will never have an end. In eternity past, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all shared in perfect fellowship and communion together as one. But three unique individuals. To say that Mary is the mother of God would mean that she's just that. She's the mother of an eternal being. And though she's referred to in that way, she is not the mother of God. She is the earthly mother of Jesus. By the power of the Holy Spirit, she conceived, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, she gave birth to the human child who would grow up to be Jesus. But it is critically important to differentiate the fact that it has nothing to do with his divinity. This is where the Roman Catholic Church and many other religions get into trouble. When they say that Mary is the mother of God or the mother of Jesus, they have, over time, continued to evolve these teachings. And today, the way Mary stands before the Catholic Church she's often represented as the mother of God, the mother of the divine, the mother of the eternal God, and the mother of the eternal Jesus. Now, how can an earthly woman be the mother of the divine? The nature of Jesus is that he is fully God. And when he was born into this world 
through a normal birth, with the exception of the conception, obviously. He was not conceived through Joseph. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. But he was born in the form of man. But his essence was not that of a man. His essence was a supreme, eternal being. And Mary had nothing to do with that. This is critically important. Because today, the church refers to Mary as co-redemptrix with Jesus Christ, meaning Mary is just as much redeemer and savior as Jesus is. That is blasphemy. Mary was a woman born as a sinner, just like every single man and woman born into this world. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing this. And if it is, I'm not being insensitive here. But I have to clarify this. Because what we're preaching and teaching today in the churches that believe this is blasphemy. Mary is not God. Mary is not divine. Mary is not an eternal being in essence as Jesus, the Father, and the Spirit. She is not a fourth member of the Trinity. She is not a second Savior. There is only one, and that is Jesus himself. Now, she does have the honor of being the earthly mother of Jesus Christ. But that's as far as it goes. There is no special treatment given to Mary by God the Father, by Jesus, or by the Holy Spirit. Another example of what happens with Mary in the eyes of the Catholic Church is that since Mary is the mother of Jesus, Mary can tell Jesus what to do. That is also a lie. We'll see that in a few minutes. The one that Jesus obeyed and listened to, to the day he breathed his last on the cross of Calvary, was his heavenly Father. Mary, in that sense, had absolutely no authority over Jesus. Now, the Catholic Church in particular builds this scenario with this passage 
that since it was his mother coming to him and saying that they are out of wine, that Jesus listened to Mary rather than the Father in heaven. And that Jesus did as she asked him to do because he loved and respected her. Well, he did love her and respect her. But she had no authority over Jesus. Make no mistake about it. Jesus did not do this miracle because Mary told him to. First of all, in this passage, there is no reference to the fact that Mary told him to do anything. There's only a reference to the fact that she made him aware that there was no wine. The reason why the Catholic Church is building this up is to back up their false doctrine and teaching about Mary, who they believe, again, is a divine being. They believe she was assumed into heaven, meaning that she did not die and that she did not have to be judged like everybody else and that she did not have to be saved. That is all a lie. It is all blasphemy. There are three eternal beings that never had a beginning and never will have an end. And that is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone else is a created being. And that includes Mary. Which means Mary, again, against the teaching of the Catholic Church, Mary would have been born with a sin nature. Just like all of us. Mary has been elevated by the Catholic Church and other churches as well to a place that she had never had. To such a point that today, again, we call her co-redemptrix in the Catholic Church. But she's also a savior. By building up this story and using this passage as the springboard for this story or for this teaching of theirs, it makes, they make, Jesus sound like he would do whatever his mother wanted even over what his heavenly father wanted. And that is not true. It's as if Mary had some authority over Jesus that was given to her by the Father. And there was no special treatment ever given to her. Just the honor of giving birth to Jesus in the flesh, which would have been conceived by the Holy Spirit. which leads to another false doctrine 
about Jesus in the eyes of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church still teaches to this day that Jesus did not have any brothers or sisters because Mary was someone special and became the mother of God. I hate even saying those words. But I have to say it because this is what's being taught. Again, Mary is not the mother of God. Mary is the mother, the earthly mother of Jesus. But she has nothing to do with his divinity. She was not up in heaven with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. She has nothing to do with the divine nature. She is a created being like the rest of us. She was given a special job and purpose in this world, but that is the extent of it. Now, for the Catholic Church to teach that Jesus had no brothers and sisters is completely false. Because in several places in Scripture, the fact that Jesus had brothers and sisters is referred to right in the passage. In this passage, we can see in verse 12 that it says that Jesus... His mother and his brethren and his disciples. So you can't even mix the fact that his brethren would be his disciples. They're listed as two separate groups of people. Jesus had earthly family. This passage does not say how many. But he certainly had brothers. He probably had sisters as well. This is the first mention of it. Later in scripture, there's a passage that talks about the fact that Jesus was notified that his mother and his brothers and sisters were there to see him. He was told that twice. And his response was, Who are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters? And then he looks around the room and he says, It is those who do the will of my Father in heaven. This passage clearly shows that, again, it's referencing the fact that Jesus had earthly family. But Jesus showed his earthly family no preferential treatment. They had to go through and do exactly as the rest of us have to do. They are all created beings born of man, born of the flesh, that means born into sin. What's worth mentioning here is even though in other passages it says that Jesus was told twice that his mother and brothers and sisters were there. There's no mention of him ever leaving his brothers and sisters in Christ in the room that he was in. Those passages never say 
that he went out to even acknowledge his mother or his brothers or his sisters. For he identified with those that served his father as his mother, brothers, and sisters. He didn't even go to say hello. Now, if Mary were the mother of God, if Mary had any divine nature, how could he have done such a thing? She does not have a divine nature. For those that have been taught this, I understand completely how you're probably feeling right now. Because you're probably conflicted with what you've been taught and with what the scriptures say. This is not to be insensitive to your upbringing. But having gone through this myself, we are accountable to what the Word of God says, not what the physical church or man says and certainly not through the creation of a man-made religion, which is what Roman Catholicism is. It is a man-made religion as we know it today. It was politicized by Constantine and ever since then it has been an entity of the world. And while there are true believers in the Catholic Church, it is certainly not the majority. In fact, the word of the Lord to anybody who is in a false religion is to get out. Lest we be judged with the same judgment that they will be. The whole reason why the church builds this up is not to give Mary, not to only give Mary a divine nature that she doesn't have. And not only to give her a title of the mother of God, which she isn't. but also to establish Mary as someone who Jesus himself listened to. As if Mary had authority over him. Mary had no authority over Jesus. The only one who has authority over Jesus is his Father, God the Father. While Jesus is fully God and fully man, Jesus yields and obeys 
the Father. In the Godhead, the one that's at the top is God the Father. And though Jesus is fully God and just as holy, you can't have two heads or three heads or four heads. There can only be one. But the Father, Son, and Spirit all are one, but three separate beings. The Son yields to the Father, even to the point of death. For the glory of the Father. One other significant thing that Mary is lifted up to by the Catholic Church that I want to address with you today is the fact that Mary somehow has been established by the Church as the one that we pray to. For if Jesus would obey her at a wedding ceremony, certainly if Mary asks on our behalf that we may be forgiven or saved, that certainly Jesus would do that for his mother. Again, this is pure blasphemy. Will you please pick up your Bibles and read them? Will you please read the Word of God? We believe the doctrines of man. We believe the doctrines of the physical church, not the true church. We believe the doctrines of religion and cults and all these other things that deceive us and give us a completely different picture than what the Word of God says. If you remember... A number of meetings ago, I talked about the death of Jesus Christ. And as he hung on the cross, he first cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There was no mention of anyone but God. Even though Mary is written to be at the foot of the cross. He didn't say anything to her. In fact, he asked the Apostle John to watch over her and to care for her. As a son would an earthly son. But after Jesus breathed his last, we talked about the fact that the temple curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. And do you remember what we noted at that very minute? That the very throne room of God the Holy of Holies was now opened up to anyone who received the atoning work of Jesus on their behalf. Any son or daughter 
of the living God through the atoning work of Christ can walk right into the throne room of God through the shed blood of Christ and nothing else, no works, no good deeds, no religion, no law keeping. By faith, through grace, If we, by the grace of God, through Christ, can go into the very throne room of God any time, and we can call him Abba or Daddy, then where is all of this coming from? that we can pray to Mary who will get us forgiveness and salvation from her son. Oh, my Lord, it is blasphemy. It is idolatry, for we are worshiping another God It is God who chose his elect. It is God who chose who would be saved and when and what their purpose is in this world. It is not Mary. It is not anybody else. It is not us. To make her. a divine being when she had earthly parents just like all of us is a lie and it's blasphemy she does not tell Jesus what to do God does she does not answer prayer the Lord does How dare we? Establish a man-made divine being in a religion that contradicts the very word of God. If no one has told you this yet, then I will. While some Catholics may be saved, you need to learn the truth from the Word of God itself. Because you will be held accountable for the lies, the blasphemy, the idolatry that you partake in. Because it's not like the truth is not available to you. It's just that we do not or will not take the time to read it and study it. Or we like what the church has created because it makes it even easier for us since we don't ever have to come before the Father and the Son. And I've even heard it said that it's because they're so busy. It doesn't matter 
what the lie is. But if we do not know the truth and hold to it, we will be deceived and we will believe a lie. And it may cost you your eternity. That would be true of whatever you believe that goes against the word of God. I'm not just singling out Roman Catholics. But I have to mention it in this scenario because this is one of the passages that is used to build her up, meaning Mary, into someone that she is not. Her sins had to be atoned for just like ours do. There is only one born into this world without sin, and that is Jesus Christ himself. To say that anyone else is, is blasphemy and a lie from hell. And to make any man or woman co-redemptrix, or at a level of the divine is also blasphemy and idolatry. And God will deal with that severely. So severely. I'm asking you, please. Whatever you're believing, whether you're Roman Catholic or not, you must make sure it aligns with the Word of God or you are believing a lie. And you are serving a false God. And you are serving a false Messiah. And you are believing a false doctrine. And you are rejecting the true God. You are rejecting the true Jesus. And you are rejecting the truth of the scriptures. And we will all be judged accordingly. I am pleading with you. to make sure you know the truth. And if your life and if your beliefs are not aligning with the truth, you're running out of time to fix that by the grace of God. You're running out of time There's no do-overs, ladies and gentlemen. And I might as well remind you of this as well, even though I've brought this up before. But in light of the fact that we're talking about eternal things here, I need to remind you that there is no such place as purgatory. There is no such place where men's and women's sins can be atoned for through the prayers or the actions of anyone else other than Jesus Christ. And the doctrine of purgatory says just that, that men and women will be put in purgatory and refined and purified that they may gain entry to heaven at some point. Through who? According to the church, it's through the prayers 
of their believers and the saints and the priests. Once again, it's blasphemy because it puts the salvation of man into the hands of man. As if man, in the establishment of this lie, has any authority over God to get him to change his mind. Jesus, the Savior, spoke of only heaven or hell. And it was immediate. Now, wouldn't you think that if there was a third place that the Savior would tell us that? Yet he says nothing about it. And not only that, by the fact that the thief on the cross was told by Jesus himself that today you will be with me in paradise. Testifies to the fact that immediately we die. We either go into the presence of God or we're separated from God and we will remain in hell until the resurrection of our bodies. To believe in purgatory is to deny the teaching of the Father who never talked about it and Jesus, the Savior, who never brought it up. There's heaven and there's hell. There is no in-between. And there is no other Savior other than Jesus Christ himself. You cannot atone for anything. You cannot purchase indulgences as a get-out-of-hell-free card. And you cannot rely on the works or the prayers of anyone else who's in the same position that you are. This had to be addressed today. Because some of you may be brothers and sisters in Christ. But with what you believe, the Lord is grieved. The Lord is angry. For it is idolatry. It's a false gospel. I am more than willing to help anyone that needs help with this. But don't go forward from this study time blindly thinking that everything is okay because on the authority of scripture it is not okay and your eternity hangs in the balance So with that said, let's look at these verses again. And let's look at the truth of what is being said. So we can set the record straight. And you can do so by reading it instead of just believing what I'm telling you.
Let's go back to verse 3, please. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. This is the reality of the situation. And according to Scripture, this is what Mary communicated to Jesus. She didn't coerce him. She didn't demand of him. She didn't pull rank on him as if she was a divine being. All she told him was, they have no wine. And a response of Jesus is just as interesting. Please take a look at verse 4. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet Now, does this sound like something that Jesus would say to Mary if Mary was a divine being? No. In fact, if anything, he establishes who she is. The one who commands or asks Jesus what to do is not man. It's the Father in heaven. And the reason why that is true is because God is the sovereign God of all. It is God who chose his elect before the foundation of the world. It is God who established his will and purposes before the foundation of of the world. He doesn't wait until things happen and then say, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now? He is not caught by surprise with anything. But it is God who gives the commands. Not man, and that includes his earthly mother. I'm referring to Jesus, of course. It is the Lord, for it is the will of the Lord, and it is the plan of the Lord, and the purpose of the Lord that will be accomplished. Not the will of man. Did the father know this would happen? Absolutely. How could a sovereign God not know? Did the sovereign God allow Jesus to be in this situation according to 
the purposes of God and the will of God? Yes, he absolutely did. Did the Father allow Jesus to take care of the situation for a number of reasons? One being for the honor of the family. But as we'll see in a little while, the second reason was to encourage his disciples. who would see the first miracle of Jesus Christ. It was the will of the Lord. Not the wedding guests. Not Mary. When Mary came to Jesus in verse 3, all she told him was that there was a situation. And she came to him because the honor of the family was at stake. But all she said to him was, they have no wine. With it came no command to do anything. That's all she told him. But she knew that he would do something about the situation. Because of what it meant to the family if the father would allow. Now Mary didn't know that, but Jesus did. The response to Mary by Jesus in verse 4, first calls her woman. Not Mother Mary. Not Mary the Divine. Not Mary the Co-Redemptrix. He called her woman. And he basically set the stage to say, what do I have to do with that and to with you? It's not my time yet. My time has been established by God. Every miracle, the calling of every follower, and every single incident that happened in the life of Jesus was ordained and decreed by the Father before one of those things came to be. And we've already talked about the fact that this would also apply to any son or daughter of the living God. He has a purpose and a plan for your life that will be fulfilled in his time and for his glory. By Jesus telling this to Mary, he's not refusing to do it, for he would have consulted with his father, who obviously allowed him to do so. But he is making a statement to Mary and to all of us to say, I am here to carry out the will of the Father. I am not here to carry out the will of man. Which leads us to then how should we pray? A few meetings ago when we talked about the death of Christ, we took note of the passage of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And three times he prayed and his prayers were the same. He made his request, but then he said, yet not my will be done, but yours. And 
As a second example, please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew. And in Matthew, let's turn to... Matthew chapter 6. And let's take a note of the other prayer that Jesus prayed. Let's look at Matthew 6, starting in verse 5. It says, And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet. And when you have shut the door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and the Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. But when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you even ask. And after this manner, therefore, you should pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'll leave the rest of the prayer for you to read. I wanted to focus on verse 10. Jesus first is telling us who we pray to. It's to the Father. It's not to the saints. It's not to the priests. It's not to Mary. It's to the Father. That is who all our prayers get directed to. And our prayer needs to be done in submission, just as Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane was prayed in submission. In other words, before even a word is said as to what we need or want, it's acknowledged that the Father already knows before you even say a word. But the way we should pray is this. Not to fulfill every desire and want that we have. Do we understand that? We're not here to get everything we want when we want it. We're not here to lay claim or hold of anything. The words of Christ are simply this. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the first question we may want to ask when we pray is should we not be asking for things in accordance with the will of God instead of our will? There's many things that we want. There's many things that we desire. And God may be gracious and give us some of that. 
But do we demand that? Do we lay hold of it and make claim of it as, as, as if it's ours, regardless of what his will is? I don't know where we make a prayer like that. When the two examples of prayer we find from Christ himself are prayers that are made in submission to the will of God first. Ask what you will, but make no demands. Your prayer should include that the will of the Father be done. On earth as it is in heaven. That's how we pray. Not to priests, not to the saints. And not to Mary. But to the Father. And the Father alone. As I mentioned in verse 4. Jesus is clearly drawing a line. For all to see. Even Mary. He called her woman to show that she gets no special treatment from him. He respects her and loves her as his mother, but he's here to do the will of his father. So we're not to ask him to do things for us, especially if they go against the will of the father. Now, the fact that Jesus carried out this work in producing more wine for them had to be in accordance with the will of the Father. For we would have a real problem if Jesus, in order to obey his mother, Mary, like some insist, would be willing to disobey the will of his father, the biggest problem we would have with this is the fact that Jesus would no longer have walked a blameless, sinless life. Do you know what's at stake with that? That means that the very righteousness of Christ that you and I depend on for our eternity would not exist if Jesus did what Mary and every wedding guest wanted him to do instead of him going before the Father to see what the Father's will was then he would have possibly disobeyed the Father. And there goes his sinless life. And there goes his righteousness. And there goes our righteousness. And there goes our eternal life. Do you see why? Mary or no other can dictate anything to Jesus or take the role of intercessor and tell him who to heal and to give things to or to save. It's not Mary's will we're doing. It's God's will. I can't emphasize enough 
how important this is for you to understand. And to again ask you, please, to look at the Word of God. And learn from it. You'll be amazed at how deceived all of us already are. Don't let your pride stand in the way. Because that's a sure sign that you don't know the Lord. And that you're not relying on him. And his atoning work for your salvation. It means you remain unsaved and unredeemed. And that you will spend eternity separated from him. Jesus tells her, it's not my hour. Don't be presumptuous. And who am I to you? I'm not here to serve you. I'm here to serve my Father in heaven. Jesus sets the record straight. And setting that record straight I don't know where we could come up with the fact that Mary will listen or the, that Jesus will listen to his mother and save souls and give them whatever they need. That is changing the word of God. That is adding to and taking away from the word of God, which is also sure judgment. Jesus, or Mary went to the servants and said, whatever he says to you, do it. She made no demands on Jesus. But as being one of the people who are taking care of the wedding preparations, she just left it in his hands to do whatever needed to be done. And from there we see the actual miracle. Starting in verse 6, it says that there were six water Pots of stone. This was used for the purification of the Jews. And Jesus directed them to fill the water pots with water. And they did. They not only filled it with water, they filled it to the brim. And without saying any specific words, no magic, no nothing. Jesus then told them to draw out and bring that sampling of the wine to the governor of the feast. And they did. And when the governor or the ruler of the feast tasted the water that was made into wine, he had no idea where he came from, where it came from. In other words, he didn't know that Jesus changed the water to wine. But the servants knew. The servants knew that they're the ones that put plain, ordinary water. And yet, 
Jesus turned that plain ordinary water to one of the best quality wines that could be made. Which the ruler or the governor found shocking. And he says that at the end of verse 9 and into verse 10. For he called the bridegroom over and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets forth good wine. But when people start drinking, there's no point in continuing to serve good wine. For they can't even taste the difference between a good wine or a bad wine after drinking that much. He said that's when they serve the poor qualities of wine because people don't know the difference. But he said... You, and I'm at the end of verse 10, you have offered up the best wine for last. Jesus didn't just begrudgingly change water into wine. For the glory of his Father, He saved the best for last. Each of those six stone containers would have held 20 to 30 gallons of the best quality wine, which would have given them ample supply for the remainder of the wedding feast. The governor himself acknowledged it. But the reason why God allowed this miracle was first of all for Jesus to set the guidelines of who he served. He served the Father. And man, especially Mary, received no preferential treatment. Again, if he did, and it was not the will of God, then Jesus would have disobeyed. And there goes our righteousness. But for the glory of God, he made the absolute best, but that was not even all that the Lord accomplished with it. For his disciples would now have witnessed Jesus do his first miracle, which would have authenticated who he was. And it would be the first of many. From this point forward, it says, his disciples believed on him. This is at the end of verse 11. Actually, verse 11, I'll just reread the verse. The beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, the glory of Jesus, no one else, And his disciples believed on him. At this point, Jesus had called about half of his disciples. But through this miracle that God allowed to happen, his disciples 
came to believe that he is who he says he is. It was authenticated by this first miracle. In verse 12, we see after that, that Jesus, his mother and his brothers and his disciples went down to Capernaum for a few days. There's a couple other details that I'll cover with you when we get together next time. Just in the way of symbolism, we'll touch on those before we continue to go forward in chapter 2. But for any of you, after hearing this, who are at a place that they have been taught different things other than what the scriptures say regarding Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, Mary, or anyone else. I want to help you to come to understand the truth. Not by a religion, not by the teachings of man, but solely through the word of God. For Jesus himself is the word of God incarnate. We saw that in chapter 1. If I can help you with this, please message me, and I'll be more than happy to help you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for helping us to stand straight with some conflicting beliefs out there. Lord, my hope and prayer is, is that each person that hears this will come to know the truth and will respond by faith and receive the grace and mercy that you extend to them and the eternal life that is found through Jesus Christ and his atoning work alone. May it all be for your glory, Lord. We thank you and we pray this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. I'll look forward to seeing you on Thursday. May the Lord bless you abundantly. And may he continue to draw you closer to himself each and every day. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you soon. Bye now.